we're going to keep going in uh, what we had originally planned earlier this year for our uh, sermon series. And we had determined that beginning this week, we would begin a study in 1 Corinthians. And so we're going to begin our 1 Corinthians study today. Uh, when we made the plans uh, for what to preach this year, um, we prayed before we made plans and we asked God for wisdom and guidance in making these plans. And uh, so we trust that uh, through the Spirit's leading and guidance, um, as we submitted our, our plans to Him, as He led us to choose to, to preach through 1 Corinthians this year, that He knew that on this day, uh, we, would be, we would begin this study. And so um, my prayer for us today is we open uh, our Bibles in 1 Corinthians, and uh, we read the first nine verses together, is that God would teach us something that we need to know uh, about him and about ourselves uh, during this movement control order while we are confined and, and limited on our movements. So if you have a Bible, take it and open it to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to begin our study today. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints together, with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you, because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in every way you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed among you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Join me in prayer. Father, we come to you this morning, uh, gathered together through uh, virtual means to, um, to make a statement, Father, that, that we need you, uh, that, that we trust you, um, that we want to hear from you. Um, Father, we, we make a statement by setting aside this time to gather together that, that we are hopeless and helpless without you. So, Father, we ask that in these next few moments, as we open up your word and study it, that you would speak to us, that you would teach us, that you would comfort us, that you would give us the message that we need, um, that we might uh, live for you in such a way that you're honored and glorified and that, that we are uh, further changed for the sake of your name and for our good. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the book of 1 Corinthians is a letter written by Paul to a church in Corinth that he had planted. Uh, you can read about Paul's activity in the city of Corinth in Acts chapter 18, which we studied last year when we went through the book of Acts. Uh, Corinth is a city in Greece uh, that sits on an isthmus that connects the uh, and the southern Greece island or, or, or peninsula to the, the rest of the mainland. And because of where it's situated, it benefited greatly in the economic situation of the time as it served as a port city for people going east and west and north and south. Because of its economic base and because of its trade, it was a very multi-ethnic, uh, it was multi-religious, it was multi-linguistic. So it reminds me of our city today uh, being a center of uh, economic activity, of uh, global trade. Uh, it, in its day, Corinth was truly a global city. Um, it was wealthy. It was filled with pagan idolatry. It was filled with various philosophies. Uh, not only did it benefit economically, but it benefited um, militarily because of its strategic location. So uh, there was all kinds of unique things about the city in Corinth. Paul founded the church on his second missionary journey when he was in Corinth. As usual, Paul began his ministry in the synagogue, 
when, uh, where he was assisted by two Jewish believers, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, he lived with them for a while and engaged in, in their trade. And when Silas and Timothy joined them, Paul began preaching even more intensely uh, in the synagogue and, and went about his, his preaching and teaching on a very regular basis. Um, when most of the Jews in Corinth resisted the gospel, Paul left the synagogue, but not before one of the rulers of the synagogue named Crispus, uh, the leader, one of the leaders of the synagogue, his family uh, and, and Crispus, uh, converted to Christ. Uh, you see that in Acts chapter 18, verses 5 through 8. And after ministering in Corinth for about a year and a half, Paul was brought before a Roman tribunal by some of the Jewish leaders. Uh, because the charges were strictly religious and not civil, the proconsul of the time dismissed the case. And shortly after that, Paul took Priscilla and Aquila with him to Ephesus. And from Ephesus, Paul returned to Israel. Paul is writing this letter to Corinth from Ephesus. He's writing this letter because it has come to his attention uh, through different reports and through letters that he's received that the church in Corinth was unable to fully break with the culture from which it came. The church in Corinth was exceptionally factional, so there were divisions all throughout the church, uh, and it demonstrated its immaturity. Uh, there was a gifted teacher, Apollos. He administered in Corinth for some time, and a group of Apollos' admirers started following him as a clique, and they had little to do with the rest of the church, even looking down on the rest of the church for not following Apollos. Another group within the church devoted themselves to Paul's teaching. Another group uh, became loyal to Peter, and some simply said, I follow Jesus. And we'll see that later as we study in this, how all these divisions were playing out in Corinth. But the most serious problem of the Corinthian church was worldliness. They were unwilling to divorce themselves from the culture around them. Most of the believers could not consistently separate themselves from their old, selfish, immoral, and pagan ways. It became necessary for Paul to write to correct this, as well as to command the faithful Christians not only to break fellowship with the disobedient and unrepentant members, but to put, back the, but to put those members out of the church. So what we're going to see as we go through the, the, the book of 1 Corinthians is we're going to see there's a lot of issues, there's a lot of problems going on in that church because that church was compiled of sinners, people who had come to faith in Jesus. And quite honestly, all churches face these problems. All churches are filled with sinful people who have turned to trust Christ. And at different times in different ways, we all face different struggles. Um, and so Paul is addressing these different issues for the church in Corinth, showing them how the gospel answers all of these issues, how the gospel will overcome division, how the gospel will overcome worldliness, how the gospel will overcome all of their problems. There's many issues, but there's one solution. So that's what Paul is writing when he writes to the church in Corinth, a church that he loves and that he invested in greatly. I think in these first nine verses, there are three major lessons that we can learn as we begin to study 1 Corinthians. Uh, the first lesson we learn is this, is that God's calling means we have a new identity. Let's look at the first three verses. Paul, in a, in a very typical introduction in one of his letters, writes, Paul, called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, here again, called to be saints together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, both their Lord and ours. Paul, in the very beginning here, acknowledges the fact that God has taken the initiative, that God has called him, and that God has called the believers in Corinth to have a new identity. So Paul says that he's called by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. As an apostle, he has uh, been tasked by Christ to spread the gospel and lay a foundation of, of the teaching of Christ for churches all throughout the Mediterranean uh, world. He says to the church in Corinth that they have been called by God to be saints, to be 
sanctified, set apart in Christ Jesus. Notice also that, that Paul specifically singles out someone who's with him. He says, Paul called by the will of God to be an apostle and our brother Sosthenes. Now, we don't know 100% for sure who this brother Sosthenes is, but if you go back to Acts chapter 18, there's reason to believe that this Sosthenes is the ruler of the synagogue who took over after Crispus left the synagogue. Um, we don't know 100% for sure, but we do know that whoever this Sosthenes is, he's someone that Paul knows and the church in Corinth knows, because he doesn't have to explain who he is. And I think it's very reasonable to believe that the Sosthenes, who had been the ruler of the synagogue, became a believer of Jesus and was with Paul in Ephesus at this time. And notice he calls him our brother. He's our brother. So when we think about the new identity the, that takes place because of, because of God's calling, sometimes it leads to new functions. Uh, Paul had taken on a new task. He had taken on a new role as a messenger uh, of God to proclaim the gospel and, and plant churches and make disciples throughout the known world. But for Sosthenes, he went from being someone who was not part of this new church family, and now he's a brother. So when we look around on our, on our Zoom calls and we see brothers and sisters in Christ, we realize that, that God's call on our life has brought us into a new family. Not only are we part of a new family, but we're part of a family that's called the Church of God. The Church of God that's in Corinth, who we are people who are a Church of God in Kuala Lumpur. And we have been, by the calling of God, set apart. That's what that word sanctified means. It, it, it certainly means a lot of things about how we should live and how we, we shouldn't live. But what it literally means is we've been set apart to the service of God. And so he doubles down on that. He says that we've called to be saints together. Now, I know oftentimes uh, when people hear the word saint, they think about a particular church tradition that uh, signifies particular members who have done extraordinary, who have exemplified extraordinary means of faithfulness, and they've they've said, "Oh, this is a saint." Follow Saint So and So or Saint So and So. But when you read the New Testament, what we realize is that everyone who's called by God in Christ into the church is a saint, because by being called by God into this new family in Christ, we're all set apart for God's service. We're all set apart to be in Christ. We are saints. So as you look around, as you look around the Zoom, uh, and if we were in the, if we were in triune together and we could look around and see one another, we would see a room filled with saints. Certainly saint does have a connotation of being holy, but that's because Christ has set us apart to be holy. When we don't make ourselves holy, Christ has made us holy because of the work that he's done for us. So we have a new identity. We've been called by God. We've been brought into a new family. We are in Christ Jesus. We're a part of the church, and we are set apart for God. We are no longer members of the kingdom of darkness. We're, we're no longer to pursue worldly passions. We're, we're to pursue God. We're to pursue Christ. And we're to pursue uh, unity within the body of Christ. We belong to God. John MacArthur says this when we think about our new identity. He says, as Christians, one of the strongest rebukes we can have when we sin is to be reminded of who our Father is. And reminding ourselves of who we are should be one of the strongest deterrents to sin. Remembering our position can compel us to improve our practice. So I think it's really helpful for us to remember, uh, even in the midst of this MCO, who we are in Christ. We've been called by God. He took the initiative to call you because he loved you. He called you and he brought you into a new family. He gave you new brothers and sisters. And not only did he bring you into a new family, but he set you apart to serve him in some capacity. When we study the book of 1 Corinthians, we begin to realize that everyone in the church has been gifted in particular ways to build up the church. 
So at Gospel City Church, we recognize that by emphasizing covenant partners, that, that we are partners in the gospel together, and we all bear responsibility for building up the church together. It's not just the responsibility of the elders to build up the church, but everyone in the church comes together and shares that responsibility because we have all been gifted by God. So we have a new identity because God has called us. But secondly, when we shift down to verses four through eight, we see that God's grace, God's grace results in thankfulness. So Paul has introduced himself. He's introduced Sosthenes, who's there with him as he writes this letter. He has told the church, hey, I'm writing to you. And then he says, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. So grace to you. And because of the grace, he says, I give thanks to my God. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus. God's grace in our lives results in thankfulness. Paul is giving thanks to God for what God has done in the Corinthian church. And I think it's really interesting when we look at the things that Paul says he's giving thanks for. He's giving thanks for things that the Corinthians haven't done, but what God has done. Uh, the, the Corinthians, in many respects, have been passive recipients of God's grace. Notice what he says. He says in verse 4 that the grace of God was given to you in Christ Jesus. Uh, verse 5 says that in every way you were enriched. You were enriched. You didn't enrich yourselves, but you were enriched. Uh, verse 7 says you're not lacking any gift as you wait for the revealing. You can't reveal anything about God to yourself. No, you wait for God to reveal himself. You wait for Jesus to reveal himself at the end times. Jesus will sustain you. You can't sustain yourself. He's the one who sustains you. And he's the one who makes you guiltless in the day of judgment, in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he finishes with verse 9 saying, God is faithful by whom you were called. Even your calling was a passive. It's something you received. So notice when, when Paul gives thanks, he's giving thanks for what God's grace is doing in the lives of the Corinthian believers. So he gives thanks. Now, there's a few specific things that we should notice here. He says that he gives thanks uh, because of their uh, being enriched in all speech and knowledge. And it's interesting, in the, the Greek world at that time, two of the, the highest values that the Greek world uh, held was ideas of being able to speak eloquently and gaining knowledge. But he says that he is giving thanks that in every way you were enriched in him in all speech and knowledge. It's not just that they received and an ability to speak and, and, and have some, you know, elaborate ability to communicate. It's not that, that they had knowledge, that they had achieved on their own. No, no. It's in him that they have been enriched in speech and knowledge. There is concrete knowledge based on the reality of Christ's person and his death on the cross. He's not talking about some secret knowledge that they have to go find. He's not talking about something mystical. He's not talking about, you know, something that God is hiding from them that they have to seek out. No, no. This is something that's made known to them in Christ. And so when they speak of Christ and the knowledge they have of Christ that God has made known to them, they are enriched. We'll see later in the book of 1 Corinthians that they misunderstand the concepts of speech and knowledge. And so Paul's laying a foundation here saying that it's in Christ that you've been enriched in speech and knowledge. It's not what the pagan world thinks about speech and knowledge, but it's what Christ has given you. And so we'll see that as we go on. Another thing that Paul gives thanks for is God's grace is working in the lives of the Corinthians is that they don't lack any spiritual gift. Verse seven, you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he's certainly not saying that each 
person in the church has all the gifts of God. Certainly they have the gift of salvation uh, as Christ has been made known to them, as God called them and they called out to him in response to his calling. They have received salvation. So they have received that gift, but they've all also received a particular gift of the spirit in order to build up the church. So not every individual has all of the gifts. Actually, no individual in the church has all the gifts. It is that the church working together with all the gifts distributed amongst them are able to function as a healthy church. And so Paul wants them to know they're not lacking in anything that they need in order to function as a healthy, flourishing church. And they should be able to trust in that, that God's grace is working in them in that way. Next, he says that they have grace to endure, to be patient, to be long-suffering until the day. Notice verse 8, he says, Christ will sustain you to the end. You know, oftentimes um, we tend to think of our Christian life as something that, you know, God has saved us because of what Christ did on the cross, and now it's my responsibility to maintain that salvation, or it's my responsibility to, to do something for God to, so I can stay saved. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that God keeps us safe. Christ is the one who sustains us. We don't find assurance of our salvation based upon how we feel or how we act. We find our assurance of salvation in the finished work of Christ on the cross and his empty tomb. So we have grace. So just as Paul was giving thanks to God for the grace that was being extended to the church in Corinth, to the believers who were being sustained by Christ, we ought also to give thanks to God for how he is sustaining us by his grace. And when we feel that maybe we are not being faithful to God, when we feel that maybe we are straying or, or that, that we are not being sustained by him, we ought to press into him even more in prayer. But not just individually, but as brothers and sisters. If you're struggling, go to a brother or sister in Christ and say, pray for me. Pray for me that the grace of God that sustains me would be real and that I would know it and that I would live upon it. Because it's in Christ that we are sustained. And so he has brought us together as a body in order to experience grace together as we work towards sustaining, uh, being sustained, as we work towards uh, fulfilling everything that God has called us to be and do. So not only does he sustain us, but we know that we are forgiven. We are sustained to the end. Notice in verse 8 also, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I love that idea of being guiltless. Uh, it's, it's one thing to be said uh, that we are forgiven, that, that we, we, God doesn't find fault with us anymore. But it's another thing altogether to be said that we have no guilt. By, by not having any guilt, standing before a judge, it's not just, it's not just good enough to say, okay, you're, you're wiped clean. Because if we're wiped clean, that's fine. We're, we're wiped clean. But we don't have anything positive to give. We just don't have anything negative to be exposed, right? If our sins are wiped clean, we can say, well, I don't have any sin. But we, we don't have anything good to offer. And yet, Christ, who sustains us and will find us guiltless in the day of judgment, he's the one that provides all the righteousness for us. So as we've received a new identity in Christ, who we are because of the call of God in our life, because of the grace of God in our life working in us to renew us, uh, he's also the one who gives us this gift of righteousness. So on the day of judgment, when we stand before him, God, the judge, looks at us and says, you're not guilty. I bring no charge against you, and he welcomes us into our eternal abode because all the goodness and righteousness of Christ is given to us as a gift. God does that for us. He took all the initiative, and just as the Corinthians received that, we receive that also. And so it's wonderful. We ought to give thanks for the grace of God at work in us.
So we have a new identity because God called us. We give thanks because of the grace of God at work in our lives. And, and third, we see that God's faithfulness is exhibited in Jesus Christ, our Lord. That last verse, verse nine, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful. There are a lot of people in the world right now asking questions, uh, theological questions about the goodness of God. Perhaps you've seen memes floating around where people are asking the question, uh, is God in control? Did God know about the COVID-19 virus and could he have stopped it? Uh, did he choose not to stop it? Well, how is God at play in this? But the Christian knows that God is faithful. We know that. Just as many, many, many witnesses have gone before us and have demonstrated by their life that God is faithful, we can rest assured that God is faithful. And there's no better way for us to see the faithfulness of God than to look to Jesus. Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8 tells us that God demonstrates his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us. He is faithful to us. He will not lose us. Jesus says in the, in the Gospel of John that, that I am in my Father's hand and that you're in my hand and no one can separate us. God is faithful. He's not going to lose us. He's faithful. He's faithful. And he's going to be faithful in this pandemic. He is faithful. He's faithful to sustain us during this time. And ultimately, even though we don't know how this whole pandemic is going to play out in Malaysia or in Southeast Asia or even globally, we don't know ultimately what everything's going to look like on the back end of this. We know that through it all, God will be and is being faithful. He is. We can rest assured in that. We can rest assured in that because when we look to the cross, we see Jesus demonstrating God's faithfulness to us. In, in a time when God has every right to crush us for our sins, to judge us for our sins, to destroy us, he chose not to. He, choyed, he chose to crush his own son. He was faithful to us on the cross. Not because there's anything good and lovely about us, but because he is good and righteous and holy and wants to pour his love out to each and every one of us. But not only on the cross do we see his faithfulness, we see his faithfulness when we look at this empty tomb. We, we see an empty tomb and we see that God not only is faithful to bear uh, in the person of Jesus Christ, not only is he able to bear the punishment of sin, but he is able to overcome sin and death and the grave when we see the empty tomb. He's faithful. He's faithful. And so he takes all of those things that were accomplished on the cross and the promise of eternal life and overcoming all of our greatest enemies, and he applies those to us in Christ. That's why these, these small words that we have been called into the fellowship of his son. We are in Christ. It's reminding us of the identity and the grace of God, the new identity we have and the grace that is at work in our lives. It, it exists because we are in the fellowship of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Yes, we have a new identity. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are children of God. We are saints. We are set apart for God. We are set apart for him. We are actively, uh, we are passively receiving God's active grace in our life. And we respond to that in thanks and living for him. And, and we rejoice in his faithfulness to us. I think one thing, as we come to a conclusion of, of this study, uh, uh, as we study these first nine verses, is to look at God's grace in these first nine verses in his grace that is exhibited in the past, his grace that is exhibited in the present, and his grace that is exhibited in the future. And if you just go through and you look at these nine verses, we are reminded that God acted in past tense when he called Paul. There was, an, there was a, a, a past tense. He did this in the past. He called, right? And, and not only did he 
call in the past Paul, but he called the saints. He called the Christians in the past. But not only did he call them, he sanctified them. He set them apart in the past. And we also see later in uh, when he says that the grace of God was given to you in Christ Jesus. It was done in the past. That Christ, uh, our testimony about Christ was confirmed in us in the past. So there are reminders here of the finished work that God did in the past, but there's things he's doing in the present, right? And it's helpful to remember this. Paul was called to be an apostle. He was called, that's past, he was called to be, that's present. He was called to be. And so we were called in the past to be who we are today, right? That we are saints. We were called to be. And we're not just called to be saints individually, but we're to do it together. So it's an act of God that he's doing right now. It was in the past and it's in the present. Know also that Paul talks about his present action. He gives thanks. I give thanks to my God always for you, he says. He gives thanks for what's happened in the past. He gives thanks for what's happening in the present, in the present that they're not lacking any gift. That's happening right now. We do not, as Gospel City Church, lack any gift to be the church that God desires us to be. He reminds us that even now, God is faithful. But he also looks to the future, right? Uh, I believe it's in verse, verse 8. He will sustain us to the end. He will find us guiltless. Uh, guiltless. Uh, as we wait, we're waiting for God to reveal our Lord Jesus Christ. So what we know by faith, we will see, that we will see it and embrace it. So as we think about our new identity, as we think about the grace of God at work in our lives, and as we think about his faithfulness, we can think about it in terms of what he's done in the past, what he's doing right now in the present, and what we can trust he will do in the future. Paul was confident of that. We ought to be confident of that as well. Will you join me in prayer? Father, we thank you that we can trust you. We can trust you because you've demonstrated faithfulness in the past. You are demonstrating faithfulness to us even now in the midst of this movement control order. And we know that you will be faithful to us in the future. So God, would you continue to build us up in our faith? Would you build us up as a church, even as we're limited on how we connect only through these virtual means? Would you, would you build us up so that we might be a church that magnifies your grace, that magnifies your glory, that magnifies your faithfulness, so that somehow, some way, uh, your testimony uh, of working in our lives would be known to many. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.